Hi, this is Matt from Boutier Capital. Welcome to BCAP's Market Check, covering notable developments in equities, credit, effects, and commodities markets, and how these hold up against the economics, earnings, sentiment, and money flows. This is not meant to be an all-encompassing perspective, nor a trading recommendation of any sort, but perhaps will help you better understand where markets are coming from and where they stand. Hello everyone, today, Tuesday, April 21st, um, it's uh, 10.30, the S&P is uh, losing about uh, 50 points this morning. In this first ever episode, uh, we will cover quite a bit, uh, starting with um, major equity indices, levels and trends, um, S&P, valuations, uh, liquidities, um, so how has liquidity constraints evolved over the last few weeks and uh, how this has translated in terms of new issue activity which obviously are supporting uh, equities at the moment. Uh, some high level economics uh, trends uh, such as uh, GDP and um, earnings estimates, uh, what's happening with uh, dividends at the moment, uh, sentiment such as uh, leading economic indicators but also um, investor sentiment and a quick overlays in terms of uh, commodities and um, what does it tell us if anything on uh, economic momentum at the moment. So in this chart, in this uh, first chart, what we see uh, here, blue line, S&P 500, uh, this morning has retraced just under 2,800. Uh, I mean, did trade um, at 29 over the last few sessions. Since the March trough, um, you know, around the 2235, there's been a pretty impressive 30% rally. That's a 50% retracement from uh, the contraction we've seen from, uh, you know, uh, Feb 20th till uh, March 23rd. Interestingly, uh, very strong relative outperformance from uh, the larger caps. Uh, so one would appreciate this outperformance looking at let's say the market cap weighting S&P versus the equal weight uh, which is the orange line here as you see the ratio has expanded quite a bit um, that would also be better observed looking at uh, Russell 1k here the blue line versus the Russell 2k uh, small mid caps uh, and the ratio will be here at the bottom uh, so starting the year at 108, currently at 128. Tech obviously is being favored uh, year to date. Uh, as you may see, see here, the NASDAQ uh, versus the Dow Jones Transport uh, and the ratio expanding here as well quite a bit year to date. The FANGs are outperforming, so that would be here at the dark line versus the value uh, component of the S&P 500 and the ratio here depicted by uh, this uh, kind of uh, pink orange line uh, has expanded quite a bit. Now to better appreciate relative outperformance of those trends, uh, look at that, uh, specifically here the FANGs uh, 109 uh, so this is normalized base 100 at the end of the year 2019 versus value at uh, you know 80 so down 20 percent um, Russell 1k down 15 percent versus the smaller caps down 28 uh, percent looking at longer term trends for the S&P 500 uh, this is weekly going back to 1990 in log. Uh, so the drawdown here was about 32%. Pick the trough, 
far less than what we've seen in you know dot com bust or 28 29 uh, 2009 uh, great recession uh, it was f very quick as you may appreciate and the rebound has been quite spectacular equally um, something I wanted to point out was uh, leadership if any from the high beta stocks versus low beta stocks which presumably could corroborate some sort of um, you know uh, wide-ranging um, market upturn as we've seen in 2016 at the moment we are not witnessing this relative outperformance uh, something else that is interesting here um, is looking at uh, global equity indices. So the US versus the rest of the world, that's the trade that keeps on giving. Uh, here you've got the ratio going from 150 to 170 recently. Uh, looking at developed MSCI benchmarks so you've got the Eurozone uh, small rebound but nothing impressive and uh, probably here the Canada MSCI is the one that is actually faring the best um, Japan is pretty sticky to its uh, March trough levels uh, EM uh, there's been a small rebound but nothing very uh, sizable uh, actually there's been this uh, this initial interesting um, expansion in the Messi Russia but with oil collapsing that has turned the corner as for EM more specifically what I thought uh, of uh, interest sorry it's this one here it's um, so that's the um, MSCI Emerging Markets uh, ETF uh, EEM uh, versus um, so that's uh, JP Morgan's EM currencies basket as you may see it's very close actually to making new lows whereas EM equities have um, correlated positively with uh, global uh, benchmarks so you have this divergence now looking at S&P 500 uh, price earning ratios uh, first off uh, looking at uh, next 12 months uh, EPS estimates um, so as you may see they have contracted quite a bit so it's the uh, green line here as for the following 12 months uh, it, it would be that pink line here so definitely has contracted since earlier this year um, however they will be fairly in line with uh, were um, with basically EPS uh, that were forecasted at the earlier of uh, 2019 in terms of uh, valuation so for next 12 month PE uh, this is market cap weighted <clears throat> so we are very close to 20 as you may appreciate it's it stands in the rich territory um, it has seldom been higher except for you know um, a year or two before the uh, dot-com uh, burst uh, in terms of um, the following 12 months so that would be um, again looking at 2021 uh, EPS estimates so it's the pink line here uh, here too fairly high uh, something like uh, uh, top decile um, observations now someone might be interested in looking at um, 
how much leverage companies have put on the balance sheet. Um, therefore, considering EV EBITDA metrics is of interest. So here as well, let's look at uh, EBITDA estimates for the next 12 months contracting as we may appreciate on this uh, green line looking at 2021 estimates um, contracting uh, far less uh, obviously uh, leaving current EV EBITDA uh, metrics uh, at uh, 13 times next 12 months very high um, so this is in line with uh, the highest levels we've seen in 2007 and as for the following 12 months uh, it's the pink line at 12 times here to uh, fairly high uh, obviously as I pointed out earlier on there's a very high concentration in uh, a limited number of stocks looking at uh, S&P 500 now if we were to have this equal weight um, let's look at the ratios uh, as for the price earning we're still at uh, 19 times that's for the next 12 months so stands in top decile observations and then for the the following 12 months um, just under 15 times uh, so perhaps not in the top decile but fairly rich and obviously this has to be put in perspective with what's happening with EPS uh, leverage uh, prospects for growth accelerating um, you know obviously interest rate levels are uh, relevant when looking at price earnings but the pace of economic momentum is equally uh, relevant if one was to look at equal weight EV EBITDA, um, let's look at the ratios next 12 months, uh, 12 times. That's for equal weight S&P 500. Uh, so looks relatively rich over the last uh, 15 years or so. Looking at the next 12 months, we are at 10 and a half here to uh, fairly uh, rich. Um, now, if there's one chart that may, you know, uh, give you an idea of how um, the top five largest S&P 500 stocks have outperformed versus, let's say, the Russell 3K, it's that bottom panel here. Uh, so if you had put 100 bucks in both, um, baskets at the beginning of uh, 2019 uh, you'd be better off by 40 percent uh, today so that's 15 months later so massive outperformance from uh, Apple Microsoft Amazon Google and Facebook uh, talking about uh, the S&P 500 uh, market cap weighted one interesting chart is the ratio versus uh, GDP so looking at the previous 20 years um, so it's not so much the level but but the trend itself so a considerable expansion of that ratio and much higher versus where it was back in 2007 and I thought that was of uh, interest central banks all right uh, G7 central banks purchased uh, 1.4 trillion uh, US dollars of financial assets in March alone that's five times the previous monthly record which was set in April 2009 uh, assumptions at the moment are for uh, those purchases to um, dwindle uh, quite quickly um, let's see if this will materialize but assumptions at the moment are for financial asset purchases of um, 1.3 trillion dollars in April 900 billion in May 600 billion in June and about 300 billion in July uh, 
what we see here on the screen is uh, the balance sheet of uh, the Fed, uh, and this is in log going back to uh, the 1990s, and um, massive expansion uh, in dollar terms and percentage-wise um, here in uh, the Great Recession. In dollar terms, we have definitely uh, you know, outpaced what happened back then in, in this recent uh, 2020 episode and percentage wise uh, not yet but uh, one may expect that uh, 6.5 billion to quickly reach 8 billion and um, you know including all the SPV set up uh, by and funded uh, by the Fed uh, through the Treasury uh, with 10 to 1 leverage ratios. I mean, the, the 10 handle, I think, uh, will be met. And the pink line here is the Fed balance sheet as a percentage of GDP. So things looked um, good here with the retracement of that ratio from 2015 back to 2019, quickly reverse track, uh, that ratio will make um, new records uh, imminently. It's not impossible that it will reach 40 and uh, 50%. And uh, other central, central banks, which are starting from a higher uh, ratio, such as uh, Japan, and uh, the uh, European Central Bank, the ECB, uh, are also on track to see their um, ratio increase uh, substantially. Obviously, these uh, recent uh, financial purchases, uh, capital injection, um, were required in light of uh, market conditions. I mean, there was this uh, U.S. dollar uh, funding crisis uh, back in mid-March, which has reverse track, as we may see here. So that was uh, settled, but conditions here were quite desperate when looking at cross-currency uh, basis swaps. Uh, looking at um, were fairly straightforward uh, and presumed to be liquid ETFs were trading versus their NAV. I mean, the TLT 20 plus years uh, iShares ETF was trading at a 5% discount to its uh, underlying. Uh, these are uh, sovereign treasuries. Uh, you would find uh, similar observations with uh, gold miners uh, ETF uh, GDX. Also of interest, the bid ask uh, spread in the uh, uh, thirty-year U.S. Treasury, right, um, a few weeks ago, uh, was as high as 40, uh, 45 basis points, whereas its more normal uh, bid ask spread level is closer to uh, single digits, so five cents, uh, for instance. So on April uh, 9th, the Fed announced that they would um, purchase certain corporate bonds, predominantly investment grade, but also some high yield, uh, focusing on uh, falling angels. Uh, let's look at what those could be. So that's the fixed income uh, screen that I ran, uh, falling in angels in a state. So um, these uh, corporates that would have uh, moved from investment grade to high yield um, after March 22nd, um, country risk obviously being uh, the US, uh, with a credit rating not uh, below basically uh, triple B minus uh, with an expired with with, uh, with maturities um, 
on announcement of this program uh, that are uh, less than uh, five years and basically very limited number of uh, corporates about 233 and this is basically in terms of uh, outstanding size uh, what it comes up to so it's about 66 uh, billion dollars with a very high concentration in Ford Motor and then select energy names uh, Occidental Petroleum and uh, etc. The Fed also mentioned uh, an interest in purchasing um, market-listed ETFs uh, targeting uh, investment grade corporates uh, but also um, high yield uh, corporates so as you may see here in the chart actually this had a lot of investors rushing into those ETFs now here you have this uh, this uh, spike in uh, uh, shares outstanding um, starting on April 9th uh, interestingly this has also coincided with uh, with a peak in in prices worth pointing out that uh, this ETF is uh, targeting uh, by its composition uh, longer dated uh, corporates so more than 50% would actually be longer than uh, than five years uh, and about 50% would actually be would actually be falling uh, below double the credit uh, ratings let's have a look at uh, spreads here I'm uh, charting um, option adjusted uh, spreads for uh, select sectors in the US corporate uh, market so for every single sector there has been this widening of spreads in you know those few weeks towards uh, the end of Fed but more importantly during those first two weeks of, of March then uh, the Fed came in uh, with various programs outright purchasing uh, corporates lifting prices then on April 9th, uh, this facility for buying on the secondary market um, you know, corporates, including ETFs, including high ETFs, have compressed yield further. Uh, maybe one way to look at it is that it's meant to provide a floor under spreads. Um, is it meant to have them contract back where they were prior to you know the uh, covid um, crisis that we are going through at the moment i i doubt what's uh pretty sure is that uh downgrades are happening very fast and uh there's going to be uh, bankruptcies all right, let's have a look at the S&P credit rating uh, revisions. Year-to-date upgrade, 143 downgrade, about 10 times more. Uh, if you look at the chart, uh, that's the up to down ratio. It has come down very substantially. Look at the sheer size of downgrades in the first quarter alone. Uh, that's nearly 800 we are uh, 20 days in uh, the second quarter and already we are seeing double what we've seen in the full second quarter of last year and um, if one was to look at uh, uh, Moody's uh, the conclusion is uh, very similar the up to down ratio very negative and uh, substantial downgrades so far. The Fed focus being predominantly on investment grade corporates 
uh, including ETFs, has really uh, provided a substantial boost to the um, uh, to the asset class. Here, looking at uh, LQD, uh, that's an ETF specifically targeting you know U.S. investment grade corporates. Uh, you see the massive rally that happened since the lows and actually coming back to uh, pretty much meeting its uh, pre-COVID level. The bond market uh, clearly has been open for business over the, the last few weeks. Just hi highlighting a few names of interest here. Six Flags uh, raising $725 million. Um, that's for a, a five-year term at a coupon of uh, 7%. Uh, scrolling down, Dick's uh, Sporting Good, um, Levi Strauss, and uh, Marriott International, that's five three-quarter, that's $1.6 billion. Um, Burlington Store, Citimark, operating uh, theaters. Uh, that's 250 million on top of a fairly leveraged balance sheet at eight and three quarters. Uh, Transdime. Here looking at commercial and industrial loans. Uh, so that's uh, weekly data going back to 1985 in log. Uh, clearly you have this uh, upward uh, sloping channel with this uh, very clear and sizable outbreak over the last few weeks alone. So this has begun mid-March. Uh, mid um, so that's on top of, of uh, bonds. Uh, also of interest, I thought, uh, were the loans to non-depositary financial institutions and, and here, what we're seeing is about uh, an expansion of um, nearly a hundred billion dollars in one month. Here, showing uh, loans uh, not classified uh, sitting on commercial banks' um, uh, balance sheet. So, here to very sizable expansion. A quick relay on. Uh, energy prices, the front of the curve, as probably you know by now, was uh, completely destroyed uh, yesterday. What we are here looking at is the price of uh, the first uh, contract and more specifically um, here that would be the, the future for delivery in, uh, in May. The historical volatility has really gone through the roof uh, here. Is, I mean, this is a realized vol, right? This is way higher than, uh, than normal. Uh, also worth pointing out, but the, uh, the cost to uh, protect against uh, you know any uh, any decline in the future is is very high here looking at a ten dollar put for the let's say the I mean the, this is June right uh, that's unbelievable that's four bucks the, so the implied vol is above 500 percent so very expensive so if, if markets go down and you Today you actually purchased uh, this four dollar put. Uh, your your realized price is um, six dollars. Um, now the curve um, is not completely destroyed. It's clearly going down. Uh, but uh, look in you know a few quarters ahead. Uh, prices are in the uh, 25, let's say, to 35 uh, range. Now, 
as I said, prices have definitely moved uh, lower. Here I am comparing uh, a basket of, of um, futures, uh, which better, you know, represent what uh, a producer might be earning, and it's actually sixty uh, percent uh, the front, and then you know weightings are are going lower as we move out the curve, but twenty percent. Uh, December of this year and 10% June next year and 10% December next year. As you may see here on the left axis, uh, from uh, let's say 55 to 60 box levels back in Jan, we are now in the low 20s, um, quite lower versus uh, mid March. And uh, the, the spreads actually uh, have contracted uh, quite a bit. They have contracted by more than 200 basis points on the energy investment grade uh, side and on the high yield side they went from uh, 2300 to 1500 uh, basis point spread. To conclude on um, energy uh, here I'm showing uh, four ETFs uh, specifically targeting um, WTI <clears throat> some of them are actually specifically targeting the front of the curve uh, some have um, a two times leverage um, so here you know the, the USO is <clears throat> probably the, the, the largest one in the top panel what we see is the shares outstanding and the increase is, is phenomenal. Um, here looking at the USO, right, the shares outstanding uh, early March would be in the 100 level and now we are more than 10 times, um, you know, that number. In terms of price performance, uh, depicted here in the bottom panel, you know, so same colors, but showing price levels, and these are normalized to 100 at the beginning of the year. So they are all standing at 30% or less, and they have been uh, continuously falling over the last few weeks. So clearly, uh, there has been a lot of people burned out on that trade. Let's have a quick look at uh, economics and how it relays with uh, EPS and dividends uh, here top panel 2019 GDP per uh, country or, or region and here middle panel uh, 2020 um, GDP forecast uh, so this is um, year over year and um, I mean it's pretty obvious that they have been revised substantially lower. Uh, the levels themselves are also worth pointing out. So we've got, you know, negative 5% for Eurozone, negative 35 for the US, uh, China, uh, still plus three. That's a delta of about 300 basis points since the beginning of the year, where it stood at 600. So at the moment, 2021 uh, growth rate is set to pick up and uh, in most instances, it will not have GDP retrace 2020 contraction. Um, so exception here would be uh, China. Um, and uh, how does that um, relate with other observations uh, here showing non-farm payrolls um, so the previous data point was uh, pretty bad 700,000 uh, jobs lost and month-over-month variation in uh, 
PCE, you know, U.S. personal consumption in nominal dollars, you know, would have it at about one and a half percent contraction month over month. Uh, that's for March. Now, the estimate for um, for uh, April is absolutely disastrous. I had to look at it a few times, but it's a, a, a job loss of 17 million. So obviously by no means can it fit on my chart. It, looking at historical regression between non-farm payrolls and uh, how does that relate with uh, changes in, in consumption, it would have month over month PCE contract by 16.5% in the month of April versus March, which already, who, you know, which number was already lower. Um, and uh, as, you know, as we move further out uh, in time, uh, consumption is set to pick up. For the whole second quarter GDP, consumption is set to decline at an annualized rate of 22% versus first quarter. Um, obviously, consumption is a key component within GDP. For the full GDP second quarter, um, U.S. estimates stand at um, negative 26%. And um, clearly, uh, this is pretty horrendous numbers. And for the, you know, for the full year, as we saw previously, uh, numbers are, are you know, in the three and a half percent contraction range. So current estimates have the U.S. economy picking up in the third and and fourth quarter. So FYI, unemployment unemployment rate estimates currently stand at 13% across the second quarter. Uh, that's a sizable increase versus the 3.5% level we were seeing at the end of uh, 2019. As per current estimates, uh, this unemployment rate is set to decline and average about 6.5% uh, next year for 2021. Fair to say that uh, the street has been unprepared for uh, such weak economic data points. Here looking at the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index for the US, uh, it's very, very uh, weak. So data came out uh, quite weaker versus uh, estimates. It's not specific to, uh, to the US. Here looking at um, the same economic surprise index, uh, but for let's say the world, that's very, um, very negative and most definitely a, a, a big change from let's say positive surprise back in Feb to negative surprise and this initially you know began with China deceiving quite abruptly on economic data points but then here what we see is that G10 have followed S&P 500 EPS uh, backward about 152 to contract 8% over the next um, 12 months and uh, moving out uh, basically jumping 20% and 50% afterwards, so fairly upbeat um, estimates. Uh, more specifically, looking at quarterly numbers, um, backward looking current quarter, so currently sell side estimates have uh, the benchmark uh, EPS declined by 27%. Uh, this is not annualized. And then, you know, jumping from that level on uh, already the following quarters and reaching back, let's say, you know, uh, 
levels where we were in, in recent history as soon as, let's say, uh, third quarter of uh, 2020. Here looking at S&P 500 uh, time series of annual EPS, uh, worth reminding that really US EPS um, witnessed uh, a solid recovery in 2017 kind of stalled in 2019 and at the moment basically we have a lower figure for um, for the next few quarters but already baking in uh, a pretty steady rebound over the next few years and looking at uh, quarterly numbers so we've seen previously that the economic data points uh, came out on the negative side by a wide margin. Um, GDP growth rates are being trimmed uh, quite rapidly for the present year. And um, our, uh, talking about 2021, uh, baking in some sort of recovery, similar conclusion when looking at EPS so at the moment this is meant to be a uh, short-lived uh, contraction with quarterly EPS already coming back to pre-COVID levels uh, towards the end of uh, 2020. Of interest uh, what's happening with um, dividends so here is screen showing dividends that have been discontinued or omitted around the world since the beginning of the year. Um, companies with market caps above uh, 1 billion US dollars. Focusing on, let's say, North American companies, Synovis, CAE, BRP, and lower, there's gonna be quite a bit of US companies. So this is uh, a real consequence of uh, one economic contraction, but also uncertainty from uh, you know corporates when it comes down to where are we going, and three also a consideration of uh, leverage balance sheet, and in in times of uh, duress, um, you know cutting the dividend is uh, clearly. Uh, the, the decision to take it is a pretty drastic one uh, and it is being taken by more and more uh, companies so several here high-profile US names uh, you may relate to Gap, uh, Macy's, you know, uh, Ford, uh, Airlines, Hotel, uh, Boeing right that's an 81 billion market cap uh, company how does that translate into S&P 500 dividend uh, futures? Um, so here showing the 2020 future. Uh, this is normalized uh, base 100 at the beginning of the year. You see the rapid decline in uh, the um, first half of March and then, you know, Fed support this uh, optimism returns and all boats are lifted corporates are going to be saved uh, worst case they're gonna issue debt to sustain the dividend so this is what we've seen in the first uh, week of April now interestingly over the last two weeks um, these futures um, which could also be considered as um, uh, estimates have stalled or outright uh, declined. Here looking at S&P 500 dividend yield, uh, now looking at this yield versus uh, the 10-year uh, real rate, uh, looking at U.S. Treasuries, uh, signaling a possible interesting entry point especially looking at previous episodes where the spread was uh, positive. Now looking at 
some proxy I've created showing uh, the present value of uh, S&P 500 dividends uh, with a discount rate of about 5% for the next uh, decade or so uh, with some assumptions for uh, you know uh, terminal rate um, so massive contraction in uh, that present value of dividends which has started to rebound as I said also but the spread here of interest uh, the level itself doesn't mean much but clearly saying that the dividend you were receiving as per the market cap of the S&P 500 was really low uh, no uh, mid Feb, uh, great expansion, uh, and probably a great entry point too towards uh, mid March, specifically March 23rd, 12th of the market, and now back to levels where we were about six uh, months ago. So we've talked about PE. Uh, a lot of strategists will be looking at. Uh, earnings yield and how does that compare to um, real rates um, or here I'm comparing um, so market cap weighted um, earning yields versus the real 10-year US Treasury uh, yield and you have the spread here bottom panel so probably something that looked like a good entry point with a spread of 7% once again mid-March. Where are we now? Well, definitely in, in, you know, on the lower side of things. Clearly pales in comparison to uh, fantastic entry points in 2011-2012 where we were uh, in a range of you know, 8 to 9%. Uh, spread. I also like to look at earning yields spread uh, versus real triple B corporates. Um, here too, pretty interesting development and maybe, you know, at least uh, a decent entry point uh, earlier in March. Where do we stand now? Um, well, very low. Uh, that's 300 basis points here again comparing that to 2011 2012 when we were above you know the, the six handle so it's about half where we were back then here looking at a variety of uh, leading economic uh, indicators you know consumer confidence um, new orders um, excluding transportation so that would be on the service side uh, and you know uh, conference board consumer confidence specifically jobs hard to get um, so this one is is inverted it's the yellow line here so practically uh, no uh, I mean a very small percentage right uh, you see that here on the left um, negative so f less than 15 percent thought that jobs were hard to get only a few months ago uh, that compares to you know, 50 percent level at uh, uh, you know the trough of the economic cycle in, in uh, first quarter 2009 so there's quite a bit to go and here you have some sort of broad measure of leading economic indicators presented by and computed by the, the conference board um, so it's the dark blue line here so it has already contracted somewhat based on other LEIs probably going to sub 100 level closer to 95 that's based on most recent data points not to say that it will stop there or not rebound uh, but probably in the immediate future going to uh, 95 
uh, what does that mean? It doesn't seem like a big contraction going to 95 uh, as compared to 2008 and, and 9. Uh, but on a year on a year over year basis, that would be something like uh, seventeen percent uh, contraction. Seventeen percent contraction puts you here. Uh, so that would be just a bit less than what we've seen um, back in 08, 09. The thing being that the um, that LEI fell over uh, you know a, a broader extent but over a longer period of time so the year-over-year -year, uh, measurement um, look a bit more uh, benign so clearly everything is more um, speedy at the moment uh, it's falling quickly so we could breach that level but back then when we hit LEI year-over-year -year contraction of let's say that that range equities looking at s p 500 were printing like 30 to 40 percent uh that's rate of change that's one year rate of change uh so we are definitely not there at the moment the s p 500 one year rate of change is about seven percent if it was to uh you know contract by that sort of let's say 35 percent uh, levels well clearly uh, we will have um, a very different level on the S&P 500 which uh, for the sake of uh, pointing out where that level is uh, you know would have the S&P versus its one year ago you know average level uh, which is about you know 2900 um, fall to something that is closer to 1900 2k which by the way is the support level uh, the S&P 500 bounced on uh, back in 2015 and 2016 this uh, economic contraction obviously um, has uh, direct consequences consequences on um, you know on output rates and uh, and capacity rates and you know demand and supply <coughs> uh, which translate into uh, lower inflation estimates here looking at a variety of uh, US break-even rates um, look at that uh, to US 12 months negative 2.2 percent uh, still negative that's annualized so negative 0.5 percent meaning that inflation is set to rebound as per the estimates as soon as 2021 uh, but across the curve you see that levels are uh, quite lower uh, the five-year average, you know, in the uh, uh, 50 basis points uh, level. So these are direct consequences. Um, there could be an argument that this, you know, uh, bodes uh, badly for equities as these are uh, real assets in some way. Um, here looking at uh, US sovereign real rates which actually are uh, moving higher specifically you know over the last uh, week or so um, so this uh, is obviously um, a headwind uh, when it comes down to uh, borrowers uh, it's positive for for savers on the flip side and here you're looking at, uh, you know, U.S. triple B corporate uh, real interest rates. So far better than where we were back then. Uh, has also turned the corner over the last uh, few sessions. Looking at various uh, metrics as for market positioning, 
uh, put the call ratio has retraced its uh, earlier rebound uh, leaving it at a level that is below um, let's say previous 15 years uh, history uh, this is an indication of uh, bullishness in the minds of uh, retail investors so there's been uh, a decline but nevertheless the level is is above uh, average That's the put to call here latest data point uh, April 20th uh, fairly low and um, here looking at the spread between bullish and bearish uh, turn the corner but not much uh, arguably the point being that these are meant to be contrarian indicators uh, if there's not many puts purchase as a ratio of calls you know being held um, that's an indication that there's in the mind of investors perhaps not so much to, to worry and this is the time when actually um, this can be translated into complacency and it's it's good to take uh, money out of the table bouncing back to uh, select uh, commodity metrics uh, relative performance here looking at uh, gold versus copper uh, you've got the ratio uh, presented in, in the bottom panel um, actually this um, this decline has been going on for about two years now um, here we see previous episodes of a steady decline in the ratio uh, one thing interesting to point out is that the, the breakout on the upside is actually uh, a good entry point it's, it doesn't suggest that it's the ultimate low in equities uh, but as for risk adjusted metrics and uh, uh, as for a, a timing of uh, putting money at work it turned out to be uh, pretty uh, accurate uh, now looking at gold versus silver two commodities that could be considered uh, precious metals uh, one notable distinction being that uh, the industrial usage uh, for silver is about four times higher than it is for gold so 60 percent versus 15 uh, so here we see this actually continuous uh, relative outperformance of gold versus silver which looking at base metals in the top panel uh, these um, uh, numbers are actually a normalized 100 at uh, the turn of the year uh, they are all lower year to date so ranging between uh, 80 and, uh, and 90 uh, so um, contraction of 20 to 10 percent uh, aluminum uh, no rebound of late copper a little one but as you can see with the last few trading sessions turning lower uh, perhaps the better profile are when looking at uh, nickel here in green and uh, zinc uh, but look at where these levels are coming from about you know uh, 10 12 months ago um so current level is 89 let's say for nickel coming from 130 uh zinc here 85 coming from the 110 level uh, no confirmation yet that uh, there's uh, an economic recovery in play but for sure uh there would be something here uh, pretty material on the upside uh, if if uh, momentum and capex let's say and infrastructure spending would pick up here's some uh, indications of uh, Renault uh, once again where it's coming from it's coming from 140 
and but but flat year to date and uh, indications of steel uh, prices slightly down on um, on the first quarter here looking at uh, let's say lumber bottom panel that's the, the, the brown uh, line so I mean trough at uh, 65 so yes there's been this rebound but still at uh, 78 so down 22 year to date uh, here natural gas so move from 130 once again this is base 100 uh, December 31st here so everything converges to 100 but it's coming from 130 has troughed around 70 and currently at uh, 85 or 88 small rebound let's see where that goes this uh, pink line here is coal for delivery in China uh, no pickup that's that's for sure on a shorter term um, I like to look at the S&P versus uh, other time series that have definitely correlated uh, in, in the recent uh, Feb and March uh, contraction. So the first one is uh, the um, US dollar uh, inverted. So there was this massive rush in the USD when uh, the S&P contracted, uh, which has abated somewhat uh, in tune with the S&P. But if you look at the, once again, that's the, the green line, there's this recent turn uh, of interest a few trading sessions ago the S&P was actually you know making um, new highs uh, for, for, for the I mean si since the March 23rd uh, recovery uh, was trading in the high 2800s uh, but already at that time you had indication that there was uh, a rebound uh, in the making for let's say the US dollar here that's my kind of proxy for WTI um, producer prices uh, as we see here it's the gray line definitely making new lows um, and it's been weakening uh, since let's say uh, April 13 so it's already been a, a week but nevertheless the S&P was uh, on, a, on an uptrend um, US 10 year treasuries I mean there's there's not been any confirmation of, of you know th that there was uh, perhaps a rotation so I still think that it's one index worth the direction is is of note and we are very close to making actually uh, new lows so at the moment, uh, six, uh, 56 basis points. Then uh, Dr. Copper, uh, pink line here. I have summarized today's April 21st BCAP market check into the following 11 observations. Starting with uh, commodities, which are not currently supporting the argument that a pickup in activity is in the cards. Besides perhaps a recent small recovery in nickel, zinc, and natural gas. For your information, oil, copper, aluminum, nickel, and zinc, and lumber all troughed between December 08 and March 09. The chart on the screen shows that it's possible for the S&P 500 to perform well despite declining commodity prices. However, every crisis related equity recoveries began at or after a rebound, a rebound in commodity prices. Leading economic indicators are rapidly declining from top decile levels, historically speaking, as consumer and corporate confidence is eroding despite fiscal largesse. This ties directly into spending behaviors. Current estimates for the uh, second quarter consumption point to a uh, 6% quarter per quarter unannualized contraction uh, to be followed by a progressive recovery. 
2020 GDP forecast keep being revised lower. Prob probability of a recession for most economies is 100%. While the rebound in 2021 is being revised stronger, economic activity forecasted for that year is expected to be lower versus 2019. EPS estimates are also being revised lower, now calling for a yearly decline of 12% for this year, followed by a 25% recovery next year, which would leave 2021 EPS estimates about 10% above 2019 actual level. There is potential for that uh, anticipated rebound to be tamed down. Dividend futures for the following five years have somewhat recovered after being slashed by 35 to 45% during March. But their advance has stalled since about two weeks now, leaving them about 30% lower year to date. So far this year, 36 US listed stocks with a market cap of above a billion dollar have canceled their dividend, 17 of which are S&P 500 constituents, such as Boeing, Estee Lauder, and TGX. This leaves S&P 500 valuations at fairly rich levels on forward price earning, even for 2021, which bakes in a recovery, and more so on EV EBITDA metrics. Even when equal weighted, as can be seen in the chart on the screen, currently S&P 500 equal weighted next 12 month EV EBITDA stands at 11 point seven times that's about one and a half times above 2007 highs both nominal and real interest rates as can be seen here uh, the blue line here depicting the real 10-year US sovereign yield uh, being exceptionally low one could argue that earnings and dividend yield premium are supportive of equities Current levels at that front look more favorable compared to PE and EV EBITDA ratios. However, there is no clear bullish signal. An important development would be for real interest rates to sustainably track lower. Leverage has been on a steady increase over those past five years and current corporate bonds and loans issuance has actually picked up sizably since mid-March, pushing those metrics higher. S&P 500 net debt has actually more than doubled versus 2016 highs. Here on the screen, commercial and industrial loans uh, showing on the log scale since 1985 of late clearly breaking resistance on the upside. We are witnessing a tsunami of credit downgrades here showing S&P credit downgrades. These are the red bars here in the chart. Uh, very few upgrades and that thin blue line represents the ratio between uh, upgrades and downgrades. As you can see it has been collapsing quite a bit of late. Now, uh, in the first quarter, 2020, 614 downgrades at S&P. That's the most uh, we've seen for any quarter since 2010. And uh, Q2 is set to more than double that figure at current pace, considering that we have data only up till April 20th. Corporate spreads have generally retraced about 50% of their previous widening 
thanks to a proactive Federal Reserve and full approves by other central banks. It seems as if the early April bazooka announcement was a sell the news opportunity as spreads have resumed widening a little bit over the last uh, 10 days or so. Sending both investment grade and high yield prices down despite the fact that sovereign yields are actually lower in that time frame. Equity prices have held up pretty nicely for the past two weeks in the face of changing conditions for three market determinants. The first one um, is a strengthening US dollar of late. That's the green line uh, shown on an inverted scale here. Uh, two lower commodity prices here showing uh, my uh, WTI producer price uh, index and then uh, copper prices and a third one well uh, what about 10-year US Treasury yields um, retracing all of their uh, most recent increase and actually hitting recent lows I have not mentioned once COVID-19 yet I feel obliged to do so as it has precipitated countries into social lockdowns and economic slowdowns. This will be addressed in a separate video but in a nutshell I don't think this quote-unquote concern can easily be put aside. There have been several misleading information so far on that topic and I expect there will be more to come my position is one of caution.